He tore the bars away. Praise the Lord for that. Are you excited that Jesus is more victorious and powerful over death? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I sure am. It's because of that we share in that and we will live a resurrected life as well. Praise the Lord for our salvation. Have you praised the Lord for your salvation this morning yet? Yes. I was talking to the teens about that this morning. We sang a song and then I had each of them give their testimony of when they trusted the Lord as their Savior. And you know what? It's good to remind ourselves when we came to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And praise the Lord for Riverside Baptist Church and for a church that proclaims the truth of the Word of God faithfully for many years. Uh, what a blessing to be a part of this church. Uh, welcome to our church. Like I just said, it's a good one. Amen? Amen? And we are glad that the Taylors have been coming for a little while now. And Andrew and Megan, you have some visitors. Would you introduce your guests? <laughs> These are my parents, Jay and Sandy Pack from Bristol, Virginia. Bristol, Virginia. Wonderful. Glad that you could be with us this morning. If you need anything, please let us know. We're glad that you're here today. Wonderful. Thanks for bringing them. That's good. It means you like your church. Amen? <laughs> All right, just a couple of announcements. If you notice in the bulletin, it does say that we are streaming on our web page as well as on Facebook Live. So if you are at home right now and you're pretty tech savvy, you can keep watching it on Facebook if that's where you're at. But maybe you have another device that you can try to pull up the web page and see if you're able to watch that. I'm just curious to make sure it's working. I can't always check it from in here. I, got a, I checked one time and I got in trouble with Pastor. He got mad at me because I was looking. No, I'm joking. I didn't get I haven't gotten in trouble yet, huh? <laughs> Maybe today. <laughs> Maybe today. <laughs> but uh, that is good that we're able to do that. So if somebody could check on that, well, that would be great. All right. So you've been hearing about this storm. Uh, from what I hear, it's been downgraded to just a tropical storm. I like watching the news of, during this time because... Uh, I'm getting a real kick out of how these news reporters and, and weather reporters, they say this name. This is interesting to me. Because it's not Isaiah. You can't call it Tropical Storm Isaiah. It's Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> they like, love to say it that way. It's Isaiah. How do you say it? Isaiah. But they, like, they really give it all the gusto whenever they say it. So, But do do, you know, and you know what? Mrs. Horn was talking to me today. And she said that every Sunday and every Wednesday, she's excited because she looks forward to coming to church. Amen. Amen. That is good. That's the way it should be. I'm getting there. <laughs> no, I look forward to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. I love church. And uh, it's a blessing to be here. But you know what? Because of Isaiah, <laughs> there will be no service this evening. I'm not sure where they got that name. <laughs> I have an opinion. You think so? Uh, it might be something kind of related to that. I'm not sure. All right. Has there ever been a Hurricane D? <laughs> I don't know. No, there should be. He's it. <laughs> Never been a Hurricane Howard. Has it? You're the only Dean. Yeah. He's the only hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's never been a hurricane. Uh, there's never been no Howard. I don't remember if there has. There's uh, a hurricane. There's been, not been a hurricane, Mary Lou. Are you offended, sweetheart? What? Yeah. Are you offended that they haven't named a hurricane after you? I am very offended. <laughs> uh, there's been no Archie. Oh, Archie. Well, that was my great grandfather's name. Archibald. In fact, his full name was Archibald Mansfield Dean. And I just inherited part of that. Delighted to see you today. Let's have a prayer. Father, thou doest all things well, even in the storm. It just reminds me of the disciples with your son on the sea. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? And Lord, they do. This storm obeys thee. If it is a reminder of thy power, as we once in a while see in nature, then so be it. But 
thou art God, there is none beside thee. And all of the gods are just would-be demons, I guess. But they're not gods. Because thou alone art God. And that's why thy son is so precious to us. Because he only is thy son and my savior. So as I give the message in a little while about the resurrection going through the book of Matthew, I'm excited about it. And Lord, I'm excited about it not only because that's the completion of our salvation, and yet in a sense, it isn't completed. Not without our resurrected bodies. Now so promised, and that's why we trust ourselves to the word of God. So may it be clear, easily understood this morning. And for those who listen elsewhere, may someone come to Christ as Savior so simply, so easily. And may that even happen in this audience, if it's thy will. And in the Savior's name, I pray these things. Amen. Page 273. Christ the Lord is risen today. 273. You see the first, the second, and the last verse. Let's stand one last time for our scripture reading. Psalms, chapter 119, verses 73 to 80. Psalm 119, verses 73 through verse 80. And the Bible says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause but I will meditate in thy precept. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. Let's pray. Lord, we bow before you this morning, Lord, and our hearts are full of thanks. 
for your word. Lord, we can have confidence in the word of God. We can have confidence as people knowing that we believe in the truth. We have no reason to be ashamed. Lord, we can go about each day standing confident in Christ because we have trusted in the wonderful things that are written in this book. Lord, thank you for salvation. Thank you for letting us know and giving us this book that teaches us that we can know for sure that you love us, that you died for us, that you rose again, and that you will come again because of what we read in this book. We can have confidence. Lord, as we listen to the message this morning in just a few moments, and we learn again about the resurrection, Lord, what an exciting Sunday this is to be reminded from the word of God about your victory power over death. And so, Lord, encourage us today. Speak to our hearts today as we listen to the message. Lord, may we be so encouraged that we would go uh, away from here today and live this week with victory in thee because of what you have done for us and what you have accomplished on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Page 268, I serve a risen Savior. We'll sing all three verses of He Lives.
Brother Jim sent me my wife down. I want to thank you and Joanne for returning from your vacation to join us this morning. <laughs> we appreciate it very much. It beats what you had planned. What about you two going uh, camping in a tent somewhere? That was it. <laughs> uh, you'll open the Bible now, please, to the 28th chapter of Matthew. There are about three more messages remaining, and this is one of them. Matthew, please, chapter 28. <clears throat> when you look at chapter 28 and you hear the message this morning, you will see why songs were chosen for the resurrection of Christ. Let me tell you something. Every Sunday is Resurrection Day. Amen. Every Sunday is Resurrection Day. So if you want to say Happy Sunday to somebody, that's okay. If you want to say Happy Resurrection Day, that's even more appropriate. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Amen. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly. And tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Do not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. Now all is finished. If you remember the sixth saying from the cross, it is finished. And finally he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, having said, In Father, into thy hands I commend and I commit 
my spirit. In other words, my life belongs to you. God never dies. God can't die. And by the way, he said, because I live, you shall live also. And I say this once in a while, and most everybody who's been in church for any length of time have heard me say this. And so they're not surprised when I say, you're not going to die. What do you mean I'm not going to die? You're, just, you're not going to die. You're alive forevermore in Christ Jesus. Now the body may die, but you are not going to die. You see, you and I are going to be with the Lord. Paul said it so well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So all is finished now. He has died on the cross. The Sabbath is finished. There will be no more. Oh, but there, there, there are more Sabbaths. <clears throat> the Jewish people celebrate Sabbath every Saturday. I know that. So do the Seventh-day Adventists. And there are probably some others. And whatever they want to do is their business. I'm just telling them they don't need to. All the Sabbaths are ended. All the laws of God, all 613 commands in the Old Testament, they're all gone because they're under the law. And the law, the law was until Jesus Christ came. And he satisfied the law in all of his demands. So what's the purpose of the law? There's no purpose anymore. The sacrifices, completed. All were object lessons throughout centuries until the man himself, the man Christ Jesus, came and offered himself once and for all for sinners. Amen. No need for any more sacrifices. Will they continue? Yes, they'll continue oh, for another 40 years, but there won't be any need for them. The service of the priest, unnecessary. Well, they'll continue their functions because people are committed to form and function. They like religion and they like ritual. But all of that's in the past. And by the way, all that was done, Paul said in the book of Galatians, as a lesson. The law was our schoolmaster, our child guardian, if you please, the one that was alongside us to bring us to maturity. He said the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That was the purpose of the law, to bring people unto Christ. He never saved anyone. No one ever kept it. Oh, they tried, but only Jesus Christ, the giver of the law, could keep the law. And so he has abolished the law. And now all service for a priest is finished because the one and the only one that's ever been referred to as the great high priest has died for mankind. So it's all finished. A unique event, not the most unique, to me, unique means one of a kind. Now, if you say most, that means there's a comparison with others that are also supposedly one of a kind. He's one of a kind. Nothing compares to him. No one compares to him. His resurrection is the ultimate proof of all of his claims. He not only voiced it, he proved it. He was raised from the dead. He's not a great one among many. He's supreme. He's supreme by right of creation and resurrection. Now all the Gospels mention the resurrection. They don't really contradict each other. But you say, well, I read in Mark, or I read in Luke, and I read in John. I know what you read. I read it too. And I preached through it. I'm just telling you that what happens is a supplement, not a contradiction. Each delivers in his own familiar style, with his own vocabulary, with his own background, with his own culture, with his own understanding, under the supreme guidance of the Holy Spirit in what we call divine inspiration to give us four accounts of the resurrection of our Lord. Now, some people don't like it. The humanists don't like it. What is humanism? Uh, basically, humanism is a worship of the mind. It has many forms, but that's about what it amounts to. A humanist worships his mind. He believes there is no greater thought than his mind. There is no greater power than his mind. The mind is everything, and so the mind is supreme. A 
and yet often it's just so insignificant. The mind can't even begin to think of the things of God. In fact, the Bible says the mind is dark. And since God is light, and until God comes into a man's life, he can worship his mind all he wants. But when he stands before the God of creation, he will have immediately changed his mind. And then rationalism doesn't like the resurrection. It says it lacks scientific observation and repetition or verification. Doesn't that sound big and important? But that's a rationalist. A rationalist says, what my mind cannot see, conceive, what my mind cannot rationalize, doesn't happen. Let me tell you something I've told you many times in the past about the Bible. There are a lot of things in the Bible that are beyond reason. Chapter 28 is beyond reason. There's no way to reason it out. You try it all you want. It's not going to help. So the Bible is the Bible is not a book of rationalization. So there's something in the Bible, you'll see it once in a while. In fact, every time you see a miracle, there it is. There are things in the Bible that are beyond reason. But there's nothing in the Bible that is unreasonable. That's the point. Don't ever forget it. Atheism comes along. Atheism simply hates the idea of God. Why, why do people hate the Bible? Sometimes when people, you can bring up the Bible and say immediately, I don't want to hear anything about that. Not interested in what that has to say. I don't believe the Bible. Why is it people hate the Bible? And in hating the Bible, they usually hate Bible-believing churches. Uh, they'd be just as happy if they did not exist or if they just didn't meet on Sunday and practice whatever they do. Authorities say you're supposed to practice. Yeah. Atheism rejects and hates the subject of God. Why? Because God requires man to be accountable and responsible. And how man behaves in life, and especially whether he has a relationship with the Creator God or not, he's going to be held in judgment. And people don't like the idea of judgment. You can't judge me. You can't tell me what's right. You can't tell me what's wrong. I'm alone to myself, is the way so many people think. And that's why they hate God. And then there's another group of people that are just, I don't know how to describe them, except one word, indifferent. They really don't care one way or the other. But if they knew the person of resurrection, if they knew the resurrected Lord himself, the whole concept of life would now take on meaning. It would be valuable. And where they're going to be in eternity, they'd have no doubt about it. Because all that matters in life is who he is and where he is now. So let's come to chapter 28. Here are the facts as recorded by divine inspiration and multiple witnesses that I don't have time to get into this morning of the risen Christ. There are several women that are mentioned in the scripture. Matthew is mentioned them by name. He's mentioned three of them in particular. And in my imagination, and again, here we go with imagination of what's going on because they're trying to paint a picture for us. And I think there are probably a lot more women that are just not mentioned who did such great devotion and service to Christ during his ministry, believed everything that he had taught them. But when it came to the resurrection, they're a little bit shaky on that issue. The disciples had certainly been in his presence, for he taught them directly that what's going to happen, I think maybe seven times, if my memory is correct, don't bother checking my memory at the moment, check it some other time. He mentioned that he would be crucified, he would rise from the dead. Those women that attended to the needs of Jesus and those men, they heard that as well. But somehow it just didn't seem like it was going to happen. It just didn't seem like reality. Now Lazarus, I told you last Sunday morning, should have shed a lot of light on this. And in fact, if Lazarus and Martha and Mary had had been at the cross and had been at the garden where Jesus' body was prepared put away, they could have testified as to the resurrection. But I told you also, in my understanding, 
Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they're less than two miles away. They're sitting at home. They are rejoicing, rejoicing. The Savior's dead. Oh, no, no, no. He's not dead, I told you. And so they are rejoicing because they're just awaiting word. Sooner or later, the disciples are going to get it all figured out. And when they see Jesus, all of a sudden it's going to be figured out for them. And all those that follow Jesus, they're going to see him again. And when all of that happens, just give it another day, just another day, just a little bit longer. And they're sitting at home waiting for word. And the word is, he's the risen. And then they can say, <clears throat> well, I could have told you that. <laughs> Lazarus could have said, I could, I could have guaranteed that for you. And I think that's probably why they were not there, because they were so beloved of our Lord and so loved him. They're just waiting on news of the resurrection. Because they, with Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead after four days, knew all about resurrection power. So... These ladies have been there since the beginning. They were there at the beginning of the crucifixion. They were there when Joseph and Nicodemus claimed the body. They followed them to the garden tomb. They stood all by themselves, in my imagination, as they saw Joseph and Nicodemus, and maybe some of their servants who were with them, handle very gently and wonderfully and devotedly the body of the Savior. They washed it as quickly as they could. They wrapped it hurriedly. They put it in the tomb. The stone is now placed there. As you learned a couple of Sunday mornings ago, the tomb has been sealed. So, they're still there, observing all of it. And when it's done, before sundown, they had quickly made their way to their boats. But they're planning to come back, and that was on Friday evening, early Sunday morning. In fact, they're probably going to leave during the dark. The gates of Jerusalem will be locked, but they'll go through the northern and then particularly the northeastern gate, and somehow they will convince the keepers of the gate, we have a mission to perform. Would you open the gate? And a portion of the gate will be open, and they'll soon be in the garden tomb area. You see, they, I told you, were a little bit shaky about this resurrection thing. So why are they there? They don't know what to do. In, in Mark, they begin to discuss among themselves as they walk along what they were going to do about a stone. Now this stone supposedly was around that time, and they don't know how they're going to remove the stone. They're probably not aware that there are guards there. It's possible. They're probably not aware that there is a formal Roman seal on that tomb. It's possible. And they don't know how they're going to get this stone removed. Now give them faith for this, will you? They, they haven't figured it out. They're not going to be able to roll that stone out of the way. So they don't know what's going to happen. They just know that they, 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 just, they, they, just, they just got to go back. They can't stay away. And so they bring some spices. They bring some clean wrapping linens. They're going to go into the tomb. They're going to unwrap the body. they wash it again. And wrap it up more in Jewish fashion, like each blanket, as you would call it, being personally wrapped. And then the hands folded in a certain way, so forth. And they're going to do what they can do I, may I use a current word to mitigate decay? They're not going to get rid of it. But you can mitigate it for a few more days. So they're going to bring more spices. They're going to very carefully again unwrap the body, throw away the bloody bandages. And now they're going to wrap this body again, putting in more spices. They just got to show their devotion. And this is the only way they know how. So they're there. However, in verse 2, an earthquake occurs. Now there's been an earthquake just about three days prior to that, remember? Creation shook when its creator died in his body. 
and creation is going to have the earthquake shake again because the creator himself has never died and he's come back to that body and however he arranged it is entirely up to God because it definitely is a miracle the stone was not removed as they found to let him out he was already out the stone was still there now whether they saw the soldiers I don't know it's probably my guess that they didn't it's my guess that when the earthquake occurs it's my guess that when when the soldiers see the angel descend and remove the stone they're so blinded by the brilliance of heaven upon this angel that's just my imagination I understand. you're looking there you say oh, I don't see that there and you're going to say Martin Luther John Hill. but I'm thinking that probably that caused them to tremble with such fear that they became temporarily paralyzed and when they came again to their senses they pardon the expression they hightailed it out of there and we're going to find out that some if not all of them went to the Sanhedrin they didn't go back to the barracks why the seal has been broken the stone has been rolled away Maybe the one that was in charge, I told you about him last Sunday. Maybe the one that was in charge went inside and saw, there's a body missing. There's no body here. We, we saw the body here. We've been standing guard. Somebody said, yeah, well, we've been standing guard over an empty tomb. <laughs> no, they would have verified the body. And it had been there, but it wasn't there now. Now, according to Roman law, it is possible that their lives could have been forfeited. And so that's why they don't go to Pilate. Mm, are you kidding? Uh, they don't go back to the barracks. Some of them peel off and go to the Sanhedrin. We'll see how that turns out. Maybe next Sunday. And so creation now has rejoiced in that the Creator still lives. I like the expression. I kind of emphasized that when I read it at the end of verse 2. And sat upon him. Now, the other accounts say, well, there were two angels. I know there were two, and so do you. Matthew's only focusing on one right here. Uh, it's okay if Matthew can be divinely inspired, or there's the Holy Spirit inspired him, and we can allow the same thing for Mark and Luke and John. That'd be okay, right? Yeah, sure. And so he's sitting upon a stone. Now, in my imagination again, the stone is kind of flopped over. Well, maybe the critics would say, uh, whoever was on the inside was kind of in a coma. And Jesus uh, regained in the coolness of the tomb his clarity and his strength. And his body was shredded before it was ever placed there. But nevertheless, I mean... If you want something to be like you want it, if you've got a narrative, who cares about the facts is the way the world operates. Right. Facts don't matter. And the fact is, he didn't rise from the dead, according to the world. And the fact, according to the world, is that somehow he had enough strength from the inside to push against a 2,000-pound stone and push it over on its side. Let's get to the facts, shall we? And there was a great earthquake in verse 2. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. What did the angel care for Rome's guards and seals? Why, if you recall in the garden, Jesus said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Now, the minimum, <coughs> not a man, uh, let me do the math for you real quick, 72,000. So what's 16 guards, I don't care how well they're armed, against 72,000 powerful, out of this world, if you please, individuals that are angels or messengers of God and the message they have come to bring these two angels is that he's not here 
So let's get back to his focus on just one, shall we? His descriptions in verses three and four. Countenance like lightning, raiment white as snow. So I see these guys kind of getting themselves all back together and they're gone. So now, now the women come. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Well, wait a minute, they haven't said anything yet. That's all right. The angel has anticipated what's already in their minds, according to Matthew's account. We'll stay with Matthew's account. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. And he's saying in verse 6, come on in. I'm sitting on the stone. You just, just don't bother with me. Just go right on by me. Go on in. Take a look around. He said, it doesn't say that. I told you. Imagination. It takes imagination to try to get a picture of what's happening. Because it's got, not God's purpose in anything that you're going to read in Scripture to give you all the background and all the details and answer all the questions that we would like to know about. Perfect example is Genesis chapter 1. You can have 100 questions there. You can have 500 questions there. That's not God's purpose. God's just dealing with the facts. Fear not ye. I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. When you go into the one that is pointed out as being a possible tomb for Christ. I think it's very possible. I'm not going not to lay out anything on it and say this is absolutely it. Can't be any other. I've given you reasons in the past. Let's proceed with the, the imagination, shall we? There is, however, a stone shelf off to the right. There are other niches for three or four others. No one has been in this tomb except those who cut it out. And then they left it. And remember, I gave you an idea a couple of sunny mornings ago that this tomb owned by Joseph of Arimathea was very possibly arranged by himself for the body of his Lord. He was not from Jerusalem. He was from about 20, 25 miles away, a place called Arimathea. <coughs> if he wanted to prepare, and he was probably up in years doing this, then he'd have prepared for a tomb for himself there, and maybe he had. So why would he want a tomb down in Jerusalem? Uh, he's gonna return if he gets sick and he can manage it, he's gonna go back home. If he's gonna retire, probably gonna go back home. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. They didn't meet every day. They probably didn't meet every week. But when they met, he was there. So in my imagination, I think the tomb was prepared for the Lord. And that's why he bought it. That's why I had it cut out like it was. And so when they go in, here's what they're going to see. They're going to see all the wrappings collapsed. Now, the critics all say he came back to this world, so to speak. He endured his coma. He was refreshed. But he had all these wrappings on him. I have a little story I tell. I haven't told it in a number of years because I haven't been in this part of Matthew in quite a few years, as you well know. But nevertheless, we had a party one time in this building for teenagers. We had a lot of fun. It was a, a costume party. You could come dressed as anyone you wanted, and you were so supposed to dress so that other people at the party for teenagers could not recognize you immediately, and they would have to guess who it was behind your mask if you wanted to wear a Halloween-type mask. It was not a Halloween party. But nevertheless, you could wear a mask and so forth and so on. And uh, I called a couple of deacons in about an hour before the party. Now, they expected me to come to the party. The youth pastor was there. A lot of teenagers probably had about 25, 30 there at that time. And uh, so there we are. And I had the guys come in, a couple of deacons, two hours, an hour in advance, and uh, I had about uh, four rolls, toilet paper, <laughs> pardon me, uh, toilet tissue. And uh, 
I told him, I said, now, I want you to wrap my arms. I want to be a mummy. So you're going to wrap my arms. And they wrap my arms very carefully. And then I'm going to put my arms down to my side like this. And uh, having wrapped my whole body, my arms are going to go down. And then you're going to wrap around the arms. So that's the thing you do. And just leave me enough slot up here so I can see a little place to breathe and breathe through the mouth so I can say what I want to say. And then you're going to help me. And I had to move like this. <laughs> I'm moving from my office back to what, one of those rooms back there. And I'm moving like this. And I said, then you stand me up in the corner. So I had to wait about 30, 45 minutes or so till everybody got there. And I'm just standing in the, in the corner. I'm a mummy. I'd been a daddy and I always wanted to be a mummy. <laughs> <laughs> and several of the kids would come up to me and they'd want to pick up the paper. Listen, uh, I found out you'd be surprised how tough toilet paper can be. When you've got it wrapped around you four or five times, like this and this and this, and then it's your trunk of your body is all wrapped up, your legs are wrapped individually, and then my hands go down here, and then I'm all wrapped. And, and I don't think I could have just gone like Superman, and just all shredded. It wouldn't have worked. It's quite strong. So they had me well wrapped. And it took the kids for about 15 to 20 minutes to figure out who I was. And they figured out who I was by, by deduction. Everybody else is here. The only one that's not here is the pastor. Because I wouldn't say a word. I just kept breathing. And uh, it was a good disguise. They didn't figure it out until they deducted that it had to be me because I'm the only one not there. Those wrappings horizontally collapse. Now, when I broke out of my costume, I had to have some help. I said, start tearing down the outside layers of the toilet paper. And they did, and then I could finally get my hands over like this, and I could rip a little bit, and it took me about three or four minutes to get out of all that wrapping. His wrappings, I told you, collapse. There was no struggle. I had a struggle. He had no struggle. God always does things in order, because there is a, a, a large cloth, a napkin it's called in scripture, but it's a large cloth, it's a head cloth. It's placed over the head, it's pulled and like kind of tied under the chin. Like you would take my hanky here, I had to go in a store this past week, and I thought I had a mask in the car and I didn't have a mask in the car. Oh, I'm not going back home. So I pull out, I'm sure Glance is a clean one. <laughs> and I'm sure you are too. And so uh, I put this around me and I tied it up and I went into the store like that. But they would have put this thing much larger than this over the head and they would have brought it down over the entire head and then tied it under here, not back there. So the head cloth is taken off and it's folded neatly and laid over by itself. God's a God of order. And that's what they saw. No disciples removed the body. That was the fear of the religious leaders. His disciples are going to come. They're going to seal away the body. Therefore, Pilate, we need a seal, a formal seal from you, which cannot be broken except under power of death, if you will able to break it. And then we want, we want a guard there. Because he said he would rise from the dead. Interesting. The disciples didn't believe it, but his enemies did. Huh. Says something about them, doesn't it? No disciples removed the body. No one disturbed the grave clothes or rearranged the contents. He simply let it go. Departed. That's it. Religion doesn't have an answer for this, by the way. They don't have an answer for life either. So they have no answer for life. They have no answer for death. They struggle with it because it's reality, but they don't have any answers. All the answers that we need are in God's word. So the disciples are absent, and nobody on earth 
is an eyewitness of the resurrection. Even the soldiers did not see him depart from the tomb. And yet these men, when they came to behold the risen Christ, when they were offered as, it, as to one to hang with him, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me come and handle them. And in my imagine, I see, imagination, I see them slowly moving toward him, and it's almost as though, do we dare touch? And when they finally touched him, and they realized that what he just told them was true. A spirit of not flesh and bone, as you see me now. And they touched him. And the more they touched him, the more they wanted to touch him. In my imagination, I see, I see 10 disciples kind of, well, let me, let me, let, no, no, you, you had your turn, let me. And they all want to, they want to hug him. Why, when he appeared to the, to the ladies, what happens? The Bible says they held him by the feet. Why did they hold him by the feet? Because in the presence of deity, you drop to your knees and your face goes down. And when they dare to look up, all they can see is his feet. And they see the nail prints in his feet. And they realize, this, this is real. This is, this is no apparition. This is no ghost. This is no fake. And they hold him by the feet. And I see the ladies all scrambling around, the first one or two that went down, the rest of them, they all, they all want to reach out, they want to hold him by the front of the foot, the ankle, they just want to reach out and hold him as best they can, and they worship him. Hmm. I like what, I like what is said of Thomas, or said about Thomas, from Thomas. My Lord, and my God. I probably never even touch him. And that, 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 that just said it all. Now, let's go to verse 9. He says, All hail. Now, that was a common greeting. There's nothing unusual about it. it it's a word that literally means rejoice. Rejoice. It was common among the Jews when they met one another to say rejoice. You say, well, the Jews always say, shalom. I know that. And by the way, did you know that when Jews depart from each other's company, if they're kind of orthodox, they say shalom twice. So it's shalom in greeting, and shalom, shalom when they depart. It, it means peace. That's okay. It's a cultural thing. He says rejoice. Interesting. The word for rejoice, the word here, all hail, Rejoice. It's the same word that's translated elsewhere in Scripture by the word grace. Same word. So he's, he's saying grace. He who is full of grace says to them, all grace, all rejoice. Special, special recognition for special women who so loved him that they stayed with him through all of the crucifixion and showed such devotion to be there at sunrise to honor his body. So, what a wonderful greeting. Now, one more thought in verse 10. He said, go tell my... Hmm. Go tell my disbelieving comrades. Go tell, this is a denier among you. Go tell him. Go tell those who were so disloyal that they wouldn't pay careful attention when I told them that this was going to happen. They quarreled among themselves. Go tell them. Oh no. He says, go tell my brethren. Brethren, oh my used so many times in scripture. May I give you from Hebrews chapter 2. For both he that sanctifieth, that's the Lord, and they who are sanctified, that's us, are all of one 
we are in Christ, or Paul's, Paul's favorite expressions, uses it so many times, in Christ. Both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. His resurrection, and here is to me so thrilling, his resurrection is the assurance of ours. Listen carefully when I'm finished. Your salvation is not complete. I think you know that. Well, I trusted the Lord, so did I, a long time ago. But it's not complete. You see, I've been saved from the penalty of sin. I'm experiencing salvation now in being saved or delivered from the power of sin. And someday, in a resurrected body like unto his, my salvation will be complete. And so will yours. Now stand with me for prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Through repentance and faith, you and I have been born again. That means given new life in Christ. A new life that will never leave us or forsake us. A new life that will be ours forever. And someday these very bodies, wherever they are, in whatever condition they can be found, it does not matter. The Creator who gives life is certainly capable of giving resurrected life. And that's what he's going to do for you and me someday. But in the absence of the body, be present with the Lord, and then eventually we're going to have that resurrected body just like he promised. Father in heaven, I believe this book is true. That doesn't make it true. It just makes me a believer. Because it's true whether or not I believe it. But I believe this book is true. I believe every promise that thou hast made will be fulfilled completely, satisfactorily, not only to thyself, but to us. I believe someday, O oh God, that our bodies, no matter how long they've been in the grave, it just doesn't matter. They're going to be brought forth again. And we will be complete in Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you. And now I'm praying for somebody who may need to be saved. Maybe somebody in this building. Maybe somebody watching needs the Savior. May that person come to trust in Jesus Christ even today in whose name I pray. And our heads are still bowed. All to Jesus I surrender. When you come to Christ to be saved, whether you realize it at that moment, at that time, <clears throat> you're surrendering to Him. You're saying He is Lord of creation, He is Lord of all. He is Lord of regeneration. He is Lord of redemption. He is Lord of salvation. I bow before him. Have you confessed this Lord of yours openly? Why don't you do it now? Have you followed him in believer's baptism? That's not going to save you, but it will cause you to be an obedient follower of Christ. Would you make your stand to do that now? Say, Pastor, I need, I need a good church. I've been here a while, and I think I can testify that this, this is a good church, but if you're looking for a perfect one, we can't help you. Because they don't exist on this earth. What are you willing to surrender to Christ? Take your stand for him.
Father in heaven, I thank thee that these friends have met today and allowed me to open the scripture with them and share with them my heart. I believe that we're going to see thee someday and be with thee forever in resurrected these bodies, resurrected. And thank you. Thou doest all things well. Watch over us this afternoon and when the storms come by this evening, take care of us. Help us to give praise to thee in all things. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.